I tell my students when preparing a paper or a lecture, in general, always to think in terms of threes. Three is obviously a special number. It's, well, it's kind of divine. But I say, if you can't keep it to three, then I like to bump up to five. I'm not, I'm not sure why it's the, the odd number there maybe has something to do with it. But then an audience always is a little bit concerned if you hear that there's five points. I know how the drill goes. When the person says, okay, and now that was my first point, everybody looks at the watch, does some math about how long the whole thing's going to be, and you get a little worried. So I, I, I am extremely aware of time, and there are five parts here, but I think after I get through the first, you'll kind of say, ooh, okay, I got, this, is, this is going to keep moving along here. So here's what the five parts are. The importance of friendship the kinds of friendship, how to start a friendship, how to grow a friendship, and a thought or two on friendship with God. Again, the importance of friendship, the kinds of friendship, how to start a friendship, how to grow a friendship, a thought or two on friendship with God. St. Thomas is going to be our guide here on the handout that I've given you. There's actually a few more quotations from the great St. Alarid. So you're really getting a little bit of a twofer here, but don't worry, in turning to St. Alred, it's in no way turning away from St. Thomas. My entire worldview, I am grateful to say, has been formed as being a disciple, as being a student of St. Thomas, specifically in the area of friendship. So anything that I'm presenting to you here is very much in that mold. St. Alred, who actually wrote before St. Thomas, is, is very much of a mind with him. And he, at times, has just that practical suggestion that you're really going to appreciate. And I've got the reference to the book in there, Spiritual Friendship, that you might want to check out. The importance of friendship. We are made for friendship. The sooner we realize that, the sooner we'll understand the key to life. It's really all about friendship. God created us for friendship, ultimately, with himself. But the beautiful and astounding thing is, and, and this is the thing, we, all, all of these things here that we'll be talking about, you, you couldn't have made this up. This is all a very specific design. God made us for friendship with himself, but astoundingly, Essential to that plan is the friendships that we should come to have with other created human persons. And so the focus of this lecture is going to be on human friendship, but always bearing in mind that the ultimate point is divine friendship. But just as a foundation Let's begin with God's holy word, something that St. Thomas, a master of scripture, always would have done. Just to think about how it's about relationship with God is the the fundamental reality. Consider, if you will, these these few lines. Proverbs 8.31, God speaking. And my delights were to be with the children of men. Psalm 147, but the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, and those who hope in his steadfast love. Zephaniah 3. The Lord your God is in your midst, a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. Listen to this one. And he will exult over you with loud singing as on a day of festival. And then there's the incomparable. Isaiah 62, 5. As the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. And if there's any doubt that that was somehow just the Old Testament and not the New Testament too, John 14, 23. If a man loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. John 15, 11, These things I have spoken to you that my joy 
may be in you, and that your joy may be full. John 15, 15. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Our God rejoices to be with us. This is at the root, I suggest, of everything. And it includes our being friends with other human persons. Somehow, that is all beautifully of a piece. Friendship, is it the most intimate of all the relationships? Let's consider friendship through a couple of basic principles about friendship. These I'm taking straight from Aristotle through St. Thomas. Friendship is about shared life. This is always the principle in Aristotle and St. Thomas. Friendship is about sharing one life together. Shared life. Another basic principle. Friendship always implies a certain kind of equality and union. Indeed, Aristotle and St. Thomas say, friendship arises from and consists in a kind of equality. We're not going to be able to linger over this point, but it's, it's, it's worth stopping and noting for a moment. Can a king and a pauper really be friends? You know, there's, there's, there's so much in, in, in literature about this. If your lives are too far apart, then you can't really live one life together. Remember Roman Holiday? Right? If, 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 if you're from two completely different worlds, then it, it, and you can't get those worlds together, you're not really going to be able to be friends. So there's something very beautiful here that points to friendship really is about being in this very much together with a basic equality between one another. It's a kind of lived equality. Consider this in in relationship, in comparison to other very close, intimate relationships. Think of other ones that might be really close and central to life. Parents to child, siblings, spouses. Look at those relationships and consider this for a moment. We have to be careful how we say this. Would those be what you most want them to be if those people are not also friends? I mean, let me put it to you this way. I'm not trying to undercut the importance of these relationships no matter what. No matter what, your parents are always your parents. No matter what, your spouse is always your spouse. No matter what, your children are always your children. But for those relationships to be what we really want them to be, there needs to be friendship there too. It's rather remarkable, ladies and gentlemen, you probably don't don't need me to tell you this. Sometimes those so powerful, irreplaceable relationships in God's great providence might not really be friendships the way we would have so badly wanted them to be. And perhaps that's the way it's going to be in this life. God grants that one great day they be friendships the way that we so would have wanted them to be. My point here is this, that friendship is the most intimate of relationships. It is in that that our life will most be lived. Part two, kinds of friendship. I'm going to make a couple distinctions here. I'm going to give you a general definition of friendship. A lived relationship of mutual recognized goodwill. A lived relationship of mutual recognized goodwill. I'm putting the word lived in there because, again, friendship is always about living together. Watch, there's certain other relationships that you have, whether they're being enacted or not. Your great aunt is your great aunt, whether you do anything or not. 
Right? You stand in that relationship to your great aunt. But there's, you, you can't say the same thing about friends. You can't say, oh, this person's my friend over here. We don't particularly do anything. We don't share very much together, but we're still friends. No, friendship is always a lived relationship. Aristotle's brilliant on this. He asks the question, can you be friends at a distance? And he points out, well, yes, for a while, but if the act of friendship is not going on, then the habit of friendship will not be continued. And then fundamentally, whatever you had is not really going to be a friendship anymore. So it's a lived relationship of mutual recognized goodwill. Now, many of you have probably been exposed to, seen before, Aristotle's famous basic distinction to three kinds of friendship. I'm going to have to move through a number of things rather quickly here. I'm going to hopefully... I want to expand your understanding of it, if you have already seen it before, a, a little more than perhaps what you've seen. First, let me say what they are, just as a quick reminder or as a quick intro. Friendship of pleasure, friendship of utility, and then friendship of virtue. So, friendship of pleasure. I mean, basically, this is a friendship that's rooted in we enjoy spending time together. We do various and sundry things that we enjoy being together. I mean, really, when you think about young people, Aristotle says this is particularly characteristic of young people. Young people call friends those that they enjoy being around. It's rather, it's, it's, it's very simple and straightforward. What is the root of this friendship? That they enjoy being around one another. Then you have the friendship of utility. This is rooted in providing some type of useful goods for one another. Likewise, now, as in, as in uh, Aristotle's time when he pointed this out, we use the word friend in that way too. It's a real kind of relationship that we call a friendship where we are consistently mutual to one another. We want to be mutually helpful to one another. Then we have the friendship of virtue. This is rooted in virtue, thus the name. But in other words, and here's a brilliant insight of Aristotle, is rooted in who the person most of all is. And for Aristotle, that's fundamentally to say in the person's virtue. For who, quick key, little insight there, who you and I most are is that person that God has designed us to be. Or remember, this is, this is what someone who truly loves you is able to see about you. Someone who truly loves you can see who you are in the sense of where you are right now. But then absolutely central is to be able to see through who you are right now, who you can be, and to love you right towards that. So this is, this is, this is, what's, this is what this great insight is of who you are most of all is that kind of best version of yourself. It's this kind of friendship basically requires that we be reasonably on the way to being that person, that we have some foundation in virtue, having become to some real extent ourselves, so that we're able to have this kind of relationship. That's at the heart of this great distinction. Let me just let me just jump back for a moment here, though, to point out, very often when people get this, this distinction of these three, they think, okay, well, those other two, that's kind of the, that's the, you know, the nasty uh, version of friendship, the friendship of utility, the friendship of pleasure. Lots of people just use one another. Very important that we correct that. Those friendship, good people, need to know how to have all of these kinds of friendship a friendship of pleasure, there's nothing wrong, done rightly, with having a relationship where it's fundamentally just rooted in we enjoy being together. You can still have a relationship of integrity that is not a very deep one. So this is still a real friendship. Now, no, it is true also. Aristotle points out that bad men, he asked, he asked the very important question, can bad men be friends. He says, well, yes and no. They can have the first two kinds of friendship, but because they don't have a proper character, they haven't really become themselves, you can't have this third kind. 
so they can have a friendship of pleasure, they can have a friendship of utility, and so there it's possible the bad things go on. All right, but that, don't take the misimpression from that that those two kinds of friendship are just for bad people. They can still be done with integrity, and this is very important, so just watch this terminologically. I like to use the word true friendship to mean the third kind, virtuous friendship. That's where our focus is going to be today. But no, you can still have an authentic friendship of any of the three kinds. The first two kinds of friendship are not the deeper kind that life is really most of all going to be lived in. But ladies and gentlemen, one of the biggest mistakes that we can make is to pretend to have more of a friendship with someone than we do. It's very important to recognize our limitations. It's important to see, and people too easily forget this, when Aristotle goes on and talks about the third kind of friendship, he kind of says, oh, and by the way, you can only possibly have this with a very small number of people, like think than fewer than the fingers on one hand. So if that's the case, if in Aristotle's famous division into these three kinds of friendship, you can only really have the third kinds of friendship, virtuous friendship, which we also call true friendship, with a very small number of people, then where does that leave everybody else? Well, key in kind of helping you get the big picture here is to recognize that there are these different kinds of friendships that we can have. So, in kind of setting up a, a, a thumbnail sketch and not being able to do it with, with completeness here, I give you that distinction where there are going to be some friendships where you still, here's the key, always respect one another and treat one another very well. It's rooted in charity if it's a friendship of pleasure, a friendship of utility, but still it's not able to really go deeper. It doesn't require that you know one another so well. It doesn't require that you share your life very deeply. But it still can be a relationship of integrity. Here's another one that's very seldom mentioned. The kind of friendships that are with people where you wouldn't really say it's a friendship of pleasure or of utility. It's the kind that were there time were there a context, you could go deeper with this person. But given our limitations in human life, you're not going to be able to go deeper with that person. Well, what do I have with that person? Th there's not a specific name. It's almost like you have a mini friendship, you have a baby friendship, you have the start of what could be more, could have grown into a true friendship, but never will. And there's not necessarily anything wrong with that. It's important to recognize that's part of our life also. The one other one that gets very little airtime that I also want to mention because it needs to be in the, in, in the big picture here is what Aristotle calls friendships of inequality. I'm going to call it friendship where there's a significant difference. You know what his two main examples of that are? Parent to child and teacher to student. Can there be a friendship between a parent and a child, or between a teacher and a student. <clears throat> this really deserves a whole, whole big thing in itself, but let's give it 48 seconds. <laughs> I mean, can, 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 you have, can you have a friendship between a parent and a child? I, mean, I, I, I have, the youngest of my children is eight. He, he is the spring in my stop. He's not my friend, <laughs> right? I mean, you just, you just wouldn't call him my friend. It, you know, one day. One day, if, if a certain number of things happen. If I'm a certain kind of man, and he becomes a certain kind of man, he and I might be friends. But it's not necessarily going to happen. Just teacher to student. Teacher to student is a very beautiful relationship. It's very important when he asks, can they be, can they be friends? You, you realize why he's asking that? Because he means, meant what he said when he said friendship is a kind of equality. There's a kind of intrinsic inequality between a teacher and a student. Can they be friends? And his beautiful principle throughout is if they're able to achieve, and this we're just going to have to touch and go and leave it, 
if where there's that great difference, they're able to achieve a kind of proportionate sameness. It says, yep, then they can't. I mean, this is brilliance. This is, this is philosophy where it, 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 it gives you that insight. I mean, I, I, I remember the day when I, when I finally felt I understood Aristotle saying, oh, you mean one day when a, when a son looks at his father and realizes, oh, my gosh, that's what you've been doing this whole time towards me? Oh, now maybe there can start to be a kind of proportion between us where we can stand on a kind of footing where we would call one another friends. That's a whole segment for friendship in life also. Part three, how to start a friendship. The focus now on true friendship in the sense of virtuous friendship that can only be had with a small number of people. First suggestion, become the kind of person capable of virtuous friendship. It's very easy in reading Aristotle and St. Thomas and St. Alred on this to get in our minds, oh my gosh, how am I ever going to find someone who can be my true friend? Fair enough, real issue. But, of course, let's start with the prior question. Are we the kind of person that can stand in this astounding kind of relationship that could be utterly trusted? And so many other things that we need to say that go into enacting true friendship. So I just begin, first suggestion, we're going to have to be intentional about this whole thing. So first of all, become the kind of person that will be capable of this. Second suggestion, be intentional and know what you're looking for. I love to say to my students, the best things do not happen by accident. The best things happen by the result, as the result of intentional, disciplined effort. You are never going to have a true friendship unless you knew what you were looking for and you went and searched for it and you ran the drill of making it happen. So you and I have to understand what we're looking for so as to cultivate it. Again, ladies and gentlemen, in my experience, this is extremely dramatic. I, I don't think I'm, I'm leaving the reservation by saying there's actually a, a, a fair number of people that have plenty of, of people around them that they would use the word friend for, but haven't necessarily really ever done the real thing the one which alone really banishes loneliness and fulfills human life. And so what's probably the main reason for that? Probably the main reason is that that person, or you or I, haven't become the kind of person that was capable for it. And another thing that's probably right up there is, did we know what we were looking for? So in looking at ourselves, by the way, Ladies and gentlemen, we need to judge ourselves without being hyper-judgmental, right? This is that great balance. Look at ourselves with mercy and with confidence. And pray, Lord, help me to understand myself. Help me to be merciful. Help me to realize my preciousness. But at the same time, Lord, from hidden faults, preserve me. Because if you and I aren't aware of our faults, we're not going to succeed. We're not going to succeed in this kind of relationship. It's that serious and it's extremely high stakes. Let's take a look at um, St. Thomas in quotation number three. I already gave you quotation number one from, from the Gospel of St. John. 
quotation two from St. Alred has this for a kind of zinger and the seriousness of it all. Holy alone is one who is friendless. I mean, it, it's, I, I, and I think he means friendless in the most important sense of the term there, friend. I'm on number three now. Here, here's a real gem. This is actually from Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics from which St. Thomas is drawing directly. And he's talking about virtuous friendship, true friendship. It's natural that such friendships should be infrequent, for such men are rare. Pause. Is it dramatic? I sometimes wonder what Aristotle must have thought. You know, when, you, when you put it in a Christian context and understanding original sin, it becomes, it, it, it's easy to see the big picture. How, how Aristotle must have puzzled over this, that clearly human life really only comes to its con- completion and happiness if you become virtuous and you have this true kind of friendship, but then he looks around and he sees that such a small number of people do it. It's amazing. It didn't make Aristotle despair. He, he, he just still seemed to have the attitude of, well... As much as you can get of the good life, go for that. This is what his experience shows him. The kind of men that are capable of true friendship are rare men. Further, such friendship requires time and familiarity. Watch, this seems obvious. Watch the richness with which he says this. As the proverb says, men cannot know each other till they have eaten salt together. There's, there's different, different views of exactly what that proverb means. One... one uh, uh, version of this said until they've uh, had a peck of salt, or was it two pecks of salt? Remember, a peck is two gallons. I like this. I like this view of it. If you sprinkle a little salt on it, how long would it take to go through a couple pecks of salt? In other words, it friend, it takes time. Men cannot know each other till they have eaten salt together, nor can they admit each other to friendship, or be friends till each has been found lovable and been trusted by each other. Those who quickly show the marks of friendship to each other wish to be friends, but are not friends unless they both are lovable and know the fact. (laughs) Isn't this brilliant? You first of all have to be that kind of person, and then you have to have become known to one another. I love saying to my students, Run a little drill. How many people really know you? It's a great drill to run. How many people really know us? What does it take to get to know a human person? For a wish for friendship may arise quickly, but friendship does not. Again, isn't there always ready with the right distinction to help you understand reality? You can, we, we can want to be friends with someone very quickly. There is nothing you or I can do to make friendship happen Fast. There is no such thing as speed friending. It, 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 because of the reality of what it is. St. Alred, now, we're going to turn to to get a little bit of, of very concrete on how to start a friendship. I'm going to have you take a look now at the fourth quotation, but I'm going to have you jump to uh, the, the second part of the fourth quotation, begins, since a friend. Since a friend is the partner of your soul, to whose spirit you join and link your own, your own spirit, and so unite yourself as to wish to become one from two, to whom you commit yourself as to another self, from whom you conceal nothing, from whom you fear nothing. Surely you must first choose, then test, and finally admit someone considered right for such a trust. So, ladies and gentlemen, what he's doing right there in his great masterpiece, Spiritual Friendship, he gives steps of growing in friendship. And the first two are the ones that are extremely practical that I want to bring before your eyes here very briefly as regards how to start a friendship. And again, we're talking about one that's going to go deep, and particularly with people of all age groups in here. Those, those young people tend to, to, to often haven't yet experienced the difficulty of making, and shall I say, keeping friends. Right? Sometimes as, as, as you go on in life, you just start to think, you know, what, what, what do I need to do to make this happen? 
partic- again, it was just one or two or three. Well, here, he's, he, he gives the first two steps, which should be distinguished from one another, and it's brilliant. I'm going to give you a couple of the, the, of the little lists that he gives to help you think about it. But the two first stages are choose and then test. This is, this is from St. Albert. Choose with whom to try. So why is choose the first step? Because it's, it's, it's you're discerning with whom do I think I stand a reasonable chance of being able to go deeper here. And that takes itself a bit of discernment just to kind of choose, are we really going to start to run the drill of trying to go more deeply into friendship or not? It's a very important step because you don't want to even try to start unless we've already done a bit of discernment. The next step that he's calling testing is once we've kind of done the initial sifting and made a reasonable prudential judgment. Again, you can only know so much. Ladies and gentlemen, particularly the further you've gotten on in life, you don't need me to tell you this. It's, it, it's scary sometimes. Sometimes you find quite a ways into a relationship, this isn't the person you thought it was. It's, it's, it, it's scary, and it can be discouraging. And there's only so much we can do about that. Ours being very practical. Put ourselves in the Lord's hands and be very careful about choosing with whom we're going to go deeper. And here he gives, he gives a set of characteristics that to look out for at that first step. He says, anyone entangled in certain vices will not long observe the laws and rights of friendship. And he goes on and he names four characteristics. This is not in your, on your handout. Four characteristics that undermine friendship. Be, it would be exciting to talk about each one of them. I'm just going to list them for you and, and then go on. If the person's irascible, which means prone to anger, the person's fickle, if the person's suspicious, just what comes to mind, he said, 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 if that person, whenever you start to talk to someone else and looking like you're getting into something deeper over here, all of a sudden that person's kind of jealous and suspicious of why you're going deeper with that person over there, he said, that's what I'm calling suspicious, that's not good. Irascible, fickle, suspicious. <laughs> Last one, I'm just going to tease you with this one. Verbose. <laughs> Has too much to say. Now, Albert is a monk, so maybe take... But, but in any case, I, 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 but in seriousness, I don't mean to make light of it. Look at, he, he takes you through each of those, and, and those are kind of disqualifiers. And this is where, when we're thinking, oh, this, so who, who, who are you to set yourself up as, as judge of other people, whether this person's worthy of my friendship? Ladies and gentlemen, I, I'm, I'm giving you what the wise say. They are saying, you're not setting yourself up as the Almighty here. You're being prudent. You're being reasonable in discerning with whom are you going to share your life. And it's reasonable for you and I to ask that. So then when it comes to testing, in a friend, certain four qualities should be tested. I'm just going to list them and move on. Loyalty. Right intention. Discretion. And patience. You, never, you probably wouldn't have come up with that list yourself. Just a quick funny thing that I have to tell you about on, 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 the, on the thing of discretion. It, it, it seems like you'd almost be joking. He says, all right, so when you're starting to get into a friendship with someone, all right, now, now you, want, you want to test it a little bit more. He says, choose a secret about yourself that if it gets out, it won't be too bad. Tell the person. And then wait a couple months and see if anybody else finds out. Now you know whether that person is discreet or not. You know, there's something kind of cute and there's something rather insightful about it. Where is the person that you can completely trust without you having to say, you're not going to tell anybody that, right? Who just knows, oh my gosh, I hold that one right here. We have to be willing, if we're going to take Alaric seriously on this whole testing thing, 
We have to be willing, ladies and gentlemen, to bail out. I'd like to put it this way. This is what I say on, on, on the romantic level. I like to say to those who are dating, when you're dating, be super discerning. Right up all the way, right up all the way through engagement. If, if, it's, if it's, no, 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 pause. And I know, this is always tricky because, of course, there's those that have the problem of making a commitment. And so anytime you start to give more concrete advice, then, then there's the certain people that you'd have to give something else to. If the, problem, the person who is too nervous and gets cold feet about absolutely everything, you know, then, then I'm going to say, you know, I'm going to say something a little bit different. All right? Set that person over here for one moment. All right? I wasn't pointing to anybody. Right? It's, it, all all y'all just come sit over here for a minute. And we're, we're talking to... Otherwise, be, got to be willing to bail. Got to be willing to say, this is not right. This is not going the way it should. This is, this is not a person that I can commit myself to. You got to be willing to bail out. In a similar way here with, with friendship. By, by Allard saying that you need to be choosy and in your choosing and very careful in your testing, there can come the point where you just recognize this has been so great. I am so grateful, but you know, and, and we can. Be, we're, we're not going to go. We're not going to go further. But this is. But the, here's. But this is where the analogy continues. Go back to the romantic. But once you're married, I'm not going to. I could have made a joke right then. I could have, <laughs> and I'm not going to. Once you're married, you have the freedom and the joy of knowing there is no other option. I am going to make this work. By golly, we can do this. Again, I know that has to be qualified because there are circumstances that say otherwise sometimes you know that. But as a principle, you have the freedom of now you're in it. And you, and you don't have to, did I, it doesn't matter whether you made the right decision. We made that decision. And by golly, here we are. And I'm going to love you well. Sometimes it comes to that. In a similar way, Oliver says the exact same thing about friendship. He says, once you have gone a certain distance, once you're really in there together, now you're not, you're not testing anymore. You just have to deal with this. And, and sometimes it gets very difficult. Now again, if it gets a certain level of difficulty, then that's the extreme case. But isn't, isn't that beautiful? It's, it's, a very careful, it's a very careful balance. Part four, how to grow in friendship. How to grow in friendship. We need to remember a couple things about true friendship. Two basic principles from Aristotle about true friendship. Friends seek to grow in virtue together, and friendship is most of all lived in good conversation. These two things so say so much about the beauty of virtuous friendship. Friends seek to grow in virtue together, and friendship is most of all lived in good conversation. So now, what's the I'm talking here about what can we do to be more intentional about growing more deeply in the friendships that we're in. This applies beautifully, by the way, to marriage, too. Because, again, one beautiful aspect of that is we know it's God's will that grow in friendship right here. And taking these kind of steps make a very big difference. So we, we go back to the point of the, the, the Aristotle's insight that, that changed the world, <laughs> not that, I mean, he, he just, it, I, it was seen by others, but he expressed it so powerfully. To be virtuous is to be happy. To be virtuous is to be a flourishing human person. It is that that human nature was designed for. When you become that, that is when you are most human. That is when you are most yourself. What does that mean in this case? That means always and everywhere to love someone well always most of all means to want them to become more virtuous. It's so simple, it's so powerful. If I love you in the rich sense, it means I, am, I have an eye towards. How can I bring you towards being your truest self? This 
is the day-to-day life. This is in the trenches. This is on the mountaintop of friendship. Having an eye to discerning how can I help that person be more fully himself. So first of all, just to recognize this, just to recognize this is our joy as friends, that we have the opportunity to try to do this for one another. That we have, just to, to recognize that and then to be intentional about that is already to go so far. To take it further, explicit ways of holding one another accountable. I'm basically just going to say that and then leave it at that. We need in the trenches to discern how can I find different ways to hold this person accountable and to allow myself to be held accountable by this person. Think about this. When I think about the, the paucity, the lack of true friendship out there, how many people have someone they can absolutely count on if I'm being less than myself that I know that this person lovingly, because of me, never in the slightest way of, uh, as it were, triumphing over me by pointing it out to me, but with the most astounding compassion and empathy, says to me, John, that's not you. And I say thank you, hopefully. I would say thank you, true friends would say thank you, and, and, to, and, to, and, and to figure out ways of being able to do that for one another without pushing buttons, to be purifying our own intentions so that wherever, you want a jaw dropper, find the section, I can't give you the number right now, in St. Howard's Spiritual Friendship on Fraternal Correction, where he says what fraternal correction really looks like when you come to your friend and, 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 you're, and, and you are so clearly out of love trying to help that person. There's holding one another accountable. Let's go on to cultivating good conversation. I'm going to read from the sixth quotation right now on good conversation. It's on the back side. This takes place, let's talk about how friends, true friends live together. This takes place through constant association and the exchange of thoughts and reflection. This is about to get very challenging, ladies and gentlemen. In this way, men, humans, are said to dwell with one another in an appropriate manner. How? By, by the exchange of thoughts and reflection. It says that's how human persons really dwell together. This is extremely, remember, friendship is about living together. How do human beings live together? They live together in the exchange of thoughts and reflection. In this way, men are said to dwell with one another in an appropriate manner, not as cattle feeding together, but as human beings living a life that is proper to them. Cattle can spend time together by eating in the same place. Cattle can do a number of other things together. Human beings can share their minds which is how they share their very selves in real and rich conversation. Look at this next one that comes a little bit later. Again, St. Thomas drawing out Aristotle. The he, so this is St. Thomas who says he, that means Aristotle because it's a commentary. He draws a conclusion that friendship between virtuous men is good and is always increased in goodness by exemplary conversation. Want to grow the friendship? Exemplary conversation. I go on. Friends become better by working together and loving each other. For one receives from the other an example of virtuous work, which is at the same time pleasing to him. There's, there's, there's so much going on there. But right now, I want to just focus your attention on we, that, by the way, he always, he, he takes our two principles and, and, and he melds them together. Growing in virtue together, sharing in deep conversation together. There's shared human life. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a happy marriage. And there's true friendship. People who want to share their souls, to share their thoughts, to 
share their reflections, to share what they're studying, particularly then with an eye also to growing to be the kind of person that fits with those things that we're studying and that we talk about all the time. That's how we grow a friendship. Whether a true friendship between a man and a man, and a woman and a woman, between those who are married. I'd like to spend a moment here, given the centrality of conversation, to talk about a, a particular challenge we have. This is a topic that's very dear to my heart and is, and is very difficult, and I'm going to try to just point out a couple of things here. We have to be attentive, ladies and gentlemen, to the age in which we live. And the age in which we live, in so many ways is undermining our ability to have good conversations. And if there's any truth to what Aristotle St. Thomas is saying, then that is a silver bullet in the heart of real friendship. And so I'm going to say something that's rather challenging, and, and, and in a sense it's not new, but I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to do the technology thing here, ladies and gentlemen. And one of the things that's very t- tough about this question is because there is no easy and obvious answer. But I'm going to put it to you this way. If we want to grow in the ability to have good conversation, I'm going to give you a little duo here. Here's how to be practical about growing in the ability to have good conversation. Think in terms of contexts and habits. I know that sounds a little philosophical. Hang with me for a moment. Think in terms of contexts and habits. Contexts are more external. Habits are more dispositions in your soul. If we're going to have good conversations, we are human. We are animals. We need to have a certain kind of exterior context within which for conversations to take place. I present for your consideration, we must, I can't make an argument for it right now, but we must put a priority on face-to-face conversations. In the flesh, we need to find the places, the contexts, the times where we can have these kinds of conversations. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't need me to tell you they're being taken away by countless things. And, 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 and it's here that I'm going to go ahead and I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm going to point to it. We, we, you know, we become so absorbed in our handheld device, right? This is where the rubber meets the road. And there's all kinds of things that we can point to. But when that handheld device, and then we can go over here now to the dispositions, it changes contexts and it changes habits. It changes both. We need the contexts for good conversation and then we need the kind of habits. In other words, the kind of personal disposition. Are we the kind of person that has a disposition to look to, for instance, start to ask other people, look them in the eye, ask questions about them, have the patience to enter into something. This is, these are a matter of personal dispositions. If our handheld devices changes those dispositions, then it is undermining our ability to have those conversations. And, and so I'm just trying to point out the, the, the principle by which to look at how we use handheld devices and a whole other host of technological issues. Put it in the context. Be philosophical. You have to be philosophical. We're going to have, because you have to be intentional about thinking about how to make this work. Especially the young. And you know what? It's, it's funny. It's funny now. Older people. I think still have no notion, they have no notion of the different dispositions of those whose whole life has been in the context of handheld devices. Older people can't begin to understand the difference in disposition. It's so dramatic. I'm going to give you a couple quotations here, ladies and gentlemen, from Sherry Turkle in her book, Reclaiming Conversation. Just a couple, and then we move on to our final section. Quotations under number seven. 
She has very powerful things. If you just read the first 50 pages of Reclaiming Conversation, The Power of Talking in the Digital Age, it's, 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 it's very moving. Face-to-face -face conversation is the most human and humanizing thing we do. That fits so powerfully with Aristotle's insight into the nature of friendship. Face-to-face -face conversation is the most human and humanizing thing we do. Fully present to one another, we learn to listen. Gosh, there's an awful lot said in that sentence right there. Next one. When we move from conversation to mere connection, we get a lot of unintended consequences. Boy, that's packed with implications, and I leave that to your discernment. Final one from Sherry Turkle. Technology and chance, it makes us forget what we know about life. The new, any old new, becomes confused with progress. Actually, I told you this is the last on the handout. I'm going to read you one other, one other quickie, and then we're at our last section. Every new technology offers an opportunity to ask if it serves our human purposes. But what I've found in her psychological research, what I've found is that once people have texting, chat, and email available, they stick with them even when they suspect that these are not the right tools for the job. Why? They're convenient. They make us feel in control. But when we allow ourselves to be vulnerable and less in control, our relationships, creativity, and productivity thrive. We are at a crossroads, she goes on. So many people say they have no time to talk, really talk, but all the time in the world, day and night, to connect. When a moment of boredom arises, we have become accustomed to making it go away by searching for something, sometimes anything, on our phones. The next step is to take the same moment and respond to, by searching within ourselves. To do this, we have to cultivate the self as a resource, beginning with the capacity for solitude, end quote. I was just reading Cardinal Seurat's book on the power of silence. It's an extremely powerful book. One thing that he certainly makes clear, the ability to be silent and the ability to be alone, paradoxically, are essential to be able to have any rich relationships. It's a paradox, but it is so borne out by reality. The ability to be silent and alone. And that's, again, talk about dispositions. The technology can change. If it takes away that disposition from us, now we don't anymore have the personal resources to be alone, to be silent, to have an interior life. The kind of life that at the proper time can be turned to another and shared. I just simply cannot reflect with you on a Thomistic guide to true friendship without pointing out, in view of their principles, we have perhaps the most challenging context to try to form deeper relationships that there's ever been in the history of mankind. Part five, the ultimate end, friendship with God. So now Alred says friendship is the highest step toward perfection. I'm going to be very brief here. In God's plan, human friendships prepare us for friendship with Christ. In God's plan, human friendships prepare us for friendship in, with Christ. What I want to do is put a wonderfully... I hope, beautiful, fine points on the melange of reflections that I've given on human friendship to give the context for why it has so much more importance than we ever could have imagined. Because that is particularly, not solely, but particularly God's chosen way to prepare us to live in his life with him to live in his presence, to be able to have, as it were, face-to-face -face conversation. So my suggestion here is let's be aware both in our human friendships and in cultivating our friendship with Christ that they 
are of a piece, that they must feed off of one another, that our human friendships are to be a participation in and a preparation for the divine friendship. You ready for one of the, one of the most, most beautiful points? I'm on the back side. I'm in St. Allard. It's number 10. You ready for this? Number 11. Number 11, bottom of the page. Friendship is the highest step towards perfection. All this, in the antecedent of all this, is all that he's been talking about as regards human friendship. All this begins with Christ, is advanced through Christ, and is perfected in Christ. The ascent does not seem too steep or too unnatural then from, here it is, Christ's inspiring the love with which we love a friend to Christ's offering himself to us as the friend we may love, thus mounting the steps of love to the friendship of Christ. Do you realize what that amazing sentence right there just said? Christ's inspiring the love with which we love a friend. You know what, what that means? That means that all of our friendships are part of a very specific plan where God has been at work bringing us towards friendship with him. He says he's literally inspiring our love for these other people and their love for us. I dare say, even in ones that never became what they could have and should have, ones that misfire in a certain way, it's all part of a beautiful plan that all leads us back. And so, may I now conclude then, I want to give you one more line from St. Thomas, one of my favorite little snippets from St. Thomas in quotation number 10. For the true sign of friendship is that a friend reveals the secrets of his heart to his friend. And now I close then, asking you to bear that line in mind as I go back to our opening line from our Lord in the Last Supper Discourse. Remember, friends share their deepest secrets. Quotation number one, John 15, 15, easy number to remember. You ever discouraged? John 15, 15. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant doesn't know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends for all that I've heard all that I've heard from my Father, I've made known to you. Thank you very much. I think that's a great question, and one of the most raucous lectures I've ever given was exactly on that topic. I thought that one girl was literally going to strangle me. Um, I, think, I, I think Aristotle and St. Thomas would say yes and no, and it, it, there's a very important truth. Can a man and a woman who are not married be friends in some sense? I would say in, in a limited sense, in a limited sense real sense. But because the dynamic of true friendship is always towards sharing more, there's an intrinsic limitation, and thus, in a sense, they can't. And so the only full, deep friendship between a man and a woman is in, is in marriage, where the natural dynamic of friendship towards always sharing more and more and more can go to its full, go to its full depth. Now, today is the Feast of St. Scholastica, so I know you might point out, what about St. Scholastica and her brother, St. Benedict? And there you, have it, you can have a uni unique situation where you have two religious who, in a sense, then are, are, are married and thus have a kind of freedom, not to one another, but because they have a kind of freedom by their spousal relationship in that vocation that frees them up to have a certain kind of sharing, but still it's the same thing. 
Benedict, Benedict's in the famous story between Benedict and Scholastica is saying, I got to go back now to my monastery. I can't stay here any longer, in part because you're a woman. There's a natural modesty, I think, that absolutely demands that there be that, that, that limitation. I, I know that's a little bit of a bitter pill, and I wish we could talk about it more. Thank you for your excellent talk. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, when it comes to, what if um, your friend fails the test and you know you need to fail? What's the difference between a failure that you need to fail and block forever versus keeping your door open for their, them to, to, for a future opportunity where they have necessary virtue for a real friendship? Great question. And, and, and I say, in, in a sense, the, the difference is the difference, and, and, and you need to see that difference. In other words, this is a judgment of prudence. Sometimes it turns out that you're really going to, for your own good, and I say very often it's helpful to have others, a mentor, or some other friend help us look at that situation. Sometimes, I didn't leave, read the quotations from Alred, but he's very strong on, get, particularly if someone's passions are very engaged, Sometimes it makes, us be very hard. it makes it very hard for us to see this situation. This is one of the roles that friends always need to play in our life. We need those true friends with us to help us discern about anything that's very important in our life, including a situation like this. It has it gotten to the point where I'm going to have to cut this off altogether? All Hopefully not. But again, sometimes you know, something can go chemically wrong in, something, in somebody. I mean, all kinds of strange things can happen where you might have to. Or it might just be we need to just keep a respectful distance and we'll still always still have a kind of contact. We'll always still respect one another. We'll always still be praying for one another and thinking of one another. But we know that we need to, we need to go our ways. And there's, there's no absolute formula other than to recognize there is that difference. And it depends on whether that can be reasonably done. Can we reasonably maintain still now a context, a contact? And, and then you should. And again, I just say make sure that we get some help in discerning that because that can be very hard to. So um, one of the things you, you talk about uh, as like a requirement for friendship is uh, sort of equality between persons. Um, and I've been kind of as you're talking, reflecting on the, uh, the where scriptures um, talks about um, St. John being the apostle whom Jesus loved. And I, I guess I'm, I'm trying to figure out what exactly, how, how can there be like a, a friendship like that with, you know, one is the, the incarnate God, the, the most virtuous person who ever lived, and it, it seems like there's a bit of a disparity where, where St. John is a mere man. And so I'm uh, Great, great question. First of all, I just, I just first of all note this: when, to say that um, Saint John is, is the beloved, you know, I mean, that that doesn't necessarily there doesn't have to be equality to be love, right? I mean, think about how a parent can can find a child especially beloved, right? But but there's but there's still a real difference there. But your 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 points to an absolutely critical point, which is in in a sense the whole show, and I'm I'm, I'm glad you give me an opportunity to point this out. It, remember, friendship is always about shared life. Aristotle asks the question, "Can you be friends with God?" Very clear answer. Fundamentally, no. Why? There's too great a distance. You can't share life together. That has to can only be changed by an intervention from above. That's why John 15:15 15, 15 is, is is the absolutely astounding moment. It's the, it, it's the moment that kind of puts that fine point on God saying, I have become a man to bridge the gap that only I could bridge. To say, yes, you are that different, but I'm coming here to make it so that we can. Remember, go back to the whole thing. I, I, I love saying to my students, our, our Lord understands friendship the way that Aristotle does. I, I, I'm, I'm really convinced of it that it has to be in, in shared thoughts. Again, those words, I have called you friends for all I've heard from my Father, I've made known to you. So if John is going to grow in real friendship with our Lord, he has to have his ear to our Lord's lips, which is exactly what happens, right? And they do become true friends because God has chosen to speak and by grace 
call us to overcome that difference. I mean, I mean, is this this is the fundamental reality in Christianity. God's gift of grace that allows us to now live a life like him, which is what their commandments are about too. Always remember that. The whole point of the commandments is so that we can live in a sense like God does. Um, I want to ask about, we hear so much nowadays about this topic of self-love, and I don't mean like you're selfish, I just mean that you love you love yourself, you love God, you love other people, right. and you also love you, and, and does that, is it possible to have a friendship with yourself? I mean, if you don't love yourself in a healthy way, can that in, impact your ability to really be a great friend to somebody else? Okay, I'm going to give you a real, a real quick thought on that. I, psychology will back me up on this. Good philosophy will back me up on this. Theology will back me up on this. To have, for a creature to have the ability to love, to truly love, it comes from having been loved first. And it, 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 all, it all points back to God. There is such a richness in, in God gives you and me the ability to be a lover of others. First of all, always remember, creation is an act of love. It is not poetry. It is, it is simple truth with precision to say God loved you into existence. So God loves us into existence, and he seeks to convey that to us. One of the natural ways he conveys to us how much he loves us is by our parents. That's one of the reasons why when parents don't always do what probably they really wanted to. That there can be real problems. And our God is greater than being hindered by that. He is going to get the message through. He is going to keep conveying it. We need to receive that message. It doesn't have to come from our parents. God can convey it. Otherwise, though in his loving plan, he naturally sought to do it that way. And it's a beautiful plan, isn't it? But beautiful plans can have issues that still get solved. Uh, but I, 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 I start to digress. So we get the power to love others because we've been loved, and we look at ourselves and we recognize our lovability. And so we must love ourselves through the eyes of those that have loved us and recognize how truly lovable we are. And that is a firm foundation from which then to be able to unselfishly look at others. There is a proper love of self, and I just end that by saying it's always rooted in truth. To really love ourselves well, we have to understand what it is that's most lovable about us. All that God has designed us for and made us to be as human beings in our unique individuality. God loves it. And he gives this to us, it is his, and now it is ours, and we love it according to his loving plan. So it has to be in the truth. And then we're able to see other people for who they are and really love them well. So lo love of self has to be done right, and we need to practice it. I wouldn't call yourself a friend of yourself. Be a real lover of yourself, and then you're going to love others really well. That was very wonderful. Thank you so much for everything.